Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully you all are on the right webinar tonight. This is the Idaho Trails Association Trail Master Series presentation. There's an app for that. Uh, my name is Pam Bond. I'm an uh, ITA board member, as well as general all around hiking trail maintenance enthusiast. Um, so uh, we're gonna get started here. So usually with these presentations, I'll kick it off with a little video, but that doesn't go over very well um, through the Zoom meeting. So I'm just gonna encourage everybody to uh, go out to YouTube, find our channel, subscribe to it, because if you subscribe, you'll get a notification um, whenever we post a new video. And so we have um, videos of some of our past presentations, some of our promo uh, videos, some of uh, some little videos from some of the trips we've done. So uh, go out and check that out. And just wanted to let you know that um, if we have any outdoor Idaho fans out there on May 14th, uh, they're gonna be doing a show called Trailblazers where um, they're gonna highlight some of the really awesome groups that are doing trail maintenance in Idaho, like the Idaho Trails Association. Uh, so if you wanna learn more about what people are doing to help maintain our trails, please tune in for that. And they're also gonna start streaming on May 7th. And so before we get started, um, going any further, let's talk about just a couple of housekeeping things. So um, one, this presentation is gonna be recorded, it's also on Facebook Live right now. And when, um, in a couple of days, I will send out a follow-up email to all the people who had signed up for this with this slide deck. So if you see links and information, um, that will be sent to you so that you can go find that information. And so any links you see, you'll be able to get to when I email it to you. Um, make, please make sure all of your microphones are off. If you have questions at any time, please feel free to put them in the Zoom uh, webinar chat and I will just um, call those out as they kind of come in, but we'll definitely do a big Q&A at the end as well. Also a reminder that um, Idaho Gives starts tomorrow. Usually Idaho Gives is a, a one day event, but this year, because of everything we have going on with coronavirus, there are a lot of organizations trying to do some really good things to help our community members. They've actually extended that for two weeks, starting tomorrow through May 7th. Um, and Idaho Trails Association is a part of Idaho Gives as always this year. And this year we're trying really hard to raise some money for our youth program. So if you didn't know, uh, ITA's youth program started in 2019 with just two trips, but we're hoping to expand that to eight trips by 2000, um, 2021. And this year we actually have a challenge grant from the Harry Morris Foundation for $10,000. So we can actually raise $20,000 because for every um, $2 that you give, $1 will be matched by that foundation. And our goal this year for Idaho Gives is to raise $5,000 of that. So please um, keep us in mind when um, you're looking for charitable giving opportunities. And um, if you wanna see more good work done on your trails and especially getting our youth out there, we kind of target youth who are at risk and don't usually have opportunities to get outside, maybe have never even been camping before and they're um, high school age kids, and it's a great experience for them to get out for a week and they learn about communicating and working together and obviously how to do trail maintenance. Okay, so just to give you an I, I, idea of, of what Idaho Trails Association does, a little background. So this quote here is from a um, University of Idaho College of Natural Resources Policy Analyst Group briefing saying that without additional fundings for maintenance through existing or non-dedicated sources, non-motorized trail opportunities on Idaho's national forests will likely decline. Um, so that almost goes without saying because um, you may not know that a lot of the funding that goes to um, public lands, U.S. Forest Service, BLM recreation programs has been declining for years. And that means that things like non-motorized trail maintenance is becoming less and less. 
So there are organizations like the Idaho Trails Association and some of our uh, sister organizations and um, like the Selway so Bitterroot Frank Church, the Idaho Youth Conservation Corps. There are local working groups like the um, Wood River Trails Coalition, the Backcountry Horsemen are all out doing trail maintenance um, to help kind of offset the work that isn't being done or cannot be done by um, U.S. Forest Service and BLM staff. So the Idaho Trails Association was founded in 2010. This is <laughs> supposed to be a really big year for us because it's our 10 year anniversary. We would like and are probably still planning on doing a big blowout at some point. So when we can all gather again, please uh, stay tuned for details. If you, if you are not um, an Idaho Trails Association member, or are not our new list, I encourage you to do that. You can just go out to our website, idahotrailsassociation.org, to do that. Um, and, and Idaho Trails Association, our mission really is to promote the continued enjoyment of Idaho's hiking trails. And we do this through stewardship, um, you know, being stewards of our land, getting out there, working the trails, using traditional trail maintenance skills. Uh, we use traditional trail tools, such as Pulaski's and Crosscuts, we do not use uh, chainsaws for a multitude of reasons. One of them being, we really want our volunteers to come out and connect with the, the land that they're working and um, not listening, having to listen to a chainsaw all day. And then also it's just a really fun experience um, to get out and work on a crosscut. So that kind of folds into that tradition aspect. And then education, doing things like this to, to keep our members and the larger community engaged in what we do and um, keeping them privy to the things that we're working on during the season. And then also preservation, of course, just being, you know, a really active public lands, lands owner and worker um, and, and instilling in people kind of this, this love of our lands and the resources that it has to offer. So as you can see, um, ITA has grown tremendously since it got started. Um, nearly tenfold. So uh, I will attribute this a lot to our current executive director, Jeff Halligan. He came on um, and really got our program moving. And this year, I think we tentatively had 30, almost 47 projects on the schedule. And that's pretty huge because right now the Idaho Trails Association is staffed by three people. The rest of the work that is done is all through the work of our executive board, our advisory board, and of course our, our volunteers. So how can you help? First and foremost, you can become a member. Um, it's easy enough to just go out to our website to do that. Becoming a member really just means that you give us a little something, whatever you're comfortable with. And um, that will get you signed up for our newsletter and give you the ability to sign up for some of our projects. One of the nice things about becoming a member is you get a one month advantage to sign up for projects versus non-members. And we have a number of projects you can sign up for. Family friendly, like one day trips, we usually do those like National Trails Day, National Lands Day, single day and overnight trips week-long vacation trips. We call them vacations because on some of these trips, we have um, stock come in that brings in our, our food and our tools. So really you just kind of have to show up and bring the things that you need for sleeping and dressing. All of your meals are cooked. And um, at the end of a long day, it's really nice to come back and have a hot meal sitting and waiting for you. We've started a women only weekends program uh, for all female identifying people who want to come out and learn in a really um, encouraging environment how to properly use the tools and work the trail. And as we kind of talked about, we have the youth trips. And then also we do have a trail monitoring program. So if, if you um, aren't really interested in doing trail maintenance, we also do trail monitoring. And basically this means that you get to go on a backpacking trip and collect data. And you're collecting data having to do with the condition of trails, um, where there are use sites like campsites, and that information is collected by ITA, but then given back to the U.S. Forest Service, um, who manages our wilderness areas. And then also just be an advocate, advocate for our lands. Seeing something that y'all can't hear me. I'm going to shut my video off to see if that helps. 
Is that helping? Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so yeah, just be an advocate for our public lands. Okay, so with that, um, if anybody doesn't have any questions about ITA, um, we'll get started. So please, yeah, go out to our website. Keep us in mind for Idaho Gives. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. I'm not sure. Maybe we tweet. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, we're out there. So go find us. Google Idaho Trails. You'll find us somehow. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about um, outdoor apps. And, and this is a presentation that I've done a couple of times, but it's very popular. And I'm really excited that we got to open this up to pretty much anybody who wanted to come see it. Because traditionally, I've done this presentation in the stock room of REI in Boise, and not everybody lives in Boise. Many of our members do not. So um, I thought it'd be really great to be able to share this. Uh, so tonight we'll be talking about a lot about GPS apps. Many people um, have lots of questions about these, and so I'll spend most of my time talking about those. And then also covering some survival and safety apps, really cool field guides, some other noteworthy apps, and then just touch on battery life management. So GPS apps. Uh, Adventure Allen says, a smartphone is the best backpacking GPS trip for trips worldwide. And I put a link on the bottom here. Adventure Allen is just um, somebody who, who has a really nice website and lots of great information about all things hiking and outdoors. And I've, I've, I've ended up on his pages multiple times researching for different presentations. And honestly, um, a smartphone is great for, for um, backpacking GPS and for trips worldwide because you can get maps for almost anywhere in the world now with some of these apps. So I, they're really great because, I, I mean, compared to traditional GPS units, they have a much bigger screen. They do have long battery life. and We're going to talk about how to prolong your battery life. Uh, you can save money and pack weight. So instead of carrying, maybe carrying your phone and a GPS or like having to buy maps specifically for a recreational GPS unit, um, you can just have it all on your phone. So you can also cut down on pack weight if that is a concern for you. Um, trips are always more enjoyable when your pack isn't heavy. They do have any more, they have very similar accuracy to a GPS unit, at least so much so that you're going to know pretty much where you are. Obviously, you have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. You may be off by a meter or two, or if you're in a really densely vegetated place, it may be off a little bit more, but that is also true of recreational GPS units. It's very easy to cache offline base maps, and that really just means that you can download maps that can be sitting on your device, ready to go, even if you don't have an internet connection, a Wi-Fi connection, a, a data connection of any kind. It's also really easy to capture pictures, videos, and longer text um, with some of these apps. If any of you have used, and I haven't used a recreational GPS in a while, so maybe this has changed, but when I used a recreational GPS, if you wanted to give a waypoint a name, you were really limited on what it was. It'd be like, WP001 or something like that. And then you have to remember, I remember when I was doing field work, I'd carry around a little notebook and I'd write down WP001 equals this thing. And then I'd have to go back and map that all out when I got back. Now you can just name it whatever. So if you're, you know, off hiking in Leslie Gulch or something and you put a waypoint, you can just put like Leslie Gulch trailhead and just type it all out there. So it makes it much much user, more user friendly for capturing information, but then also sharing it. So it's really easy to share this data that you've collected with your GPS, data being the, the tracks, the waypoints, the pictures, the text that you've collected while you're out there. And also I'm coming back to the idea that <clears throat> this is a multi-use system. So when you're using your phone, you can have your GPS unit, you can have your music, your books, your photos, take your, your camera, whatever you need when you're out there so you don't have to be carrying all of these extra things. All right, so the first GPS app that I'm going to talk about is, is Gaia GPS. And, and just so you all know, I am, I'm in no way like affiliated or sponsored or anything by any of these apps. This is just all for my own research. I would consider myself a power user, but definitely not an expert. I'm sure there are people who, who have even more knowledge about these apps, but I've played around with quite a few of them. And so this is just my general impression. So as I'm going through this, 
you know, take it for what it is, but then download some of these apps and try them out. Many of them have a free demo version. And so it's easy enough to just go out and, um, you know, give them a try for a weekend, you know, maybe every weekend, just pick one, go out and try it, see how you like it. Yeah, Shelly says, Guy was very useful in the enchantments, I'm assuming. Yeah, enchantments in Washington. Oh, I'm so jealous you went to the enchantments. That's awesome. Okay, so um, a little bit about Gaia. It is available both for Android and iOS iPhones. It's the one thing that I really love about this, they were way ahead. I think some of the other apps have this, but they're way ahead of the curve when it came to this online companion map. So you can go to their go to a website and it has a map on it and you kind of log in as your user. And then while you're in there, you can be creating tracks um, like routes or waypoints and you can automatically sync them up to your phone which is really awesome because you're not having to download any sort of GPX or KML file and then somehow get it on your phone. So it makes it really, really easy and slick. You can also print maps from there. Now they have this great new tool called Smart Routing where if you're wanting to make a route along a trail, you just start clicking dots kind of along that trail and it will automatically draw it along the actual trail or road. So that's really cool. Um, so obviously the things you can do with this app is mark your waypoints, record your trip track, you know, take GPS pictures. There seems to be some challenges with the GPS pictures and people getting them off. I, I don't necessarily do this much anymore, but if you wanted to, you totally could. Otherwise you can just turn geotagging on your photos on your phone. Um, be careful with that, you know, if you give somebody a geotagged photo, they automatically know where it is now. So if you have secret spots, it won't be a secret anymore. Uh, you can also back up anything that you, any waypoints or tracks that you make on your, your device back up to the online companion map. So it's very flexible that way. It can go back and forth. And then it's really easy to share things out from uh, the online companion map as well. So um, everyone always wants to know information about how much it costs, what's available. It gets, it gets a little bit ridiculous sometimes remembering all this. So I'm just gonna lay it out here. So for free, you, you really don't have that much flexibility. Um, it really just gives you one base map. You can't use it offline. You can't print maps. You can't do layered mapping, which is actually really cool. Um, but you can see with the different prices here, it's, it's, it's really obtainable, you know, 17 bucks a year, 36 bucks a year that's not that's not bad at all for something that you even if you only use it for three or four times during the hiking season I still think it's well worth the money for the for what you get for it so the nice thing is I, I'm a premium member because I like that you can do layered mapping and that that really just means like I could take a US topo map and then layer like a, a, a slope layer on top of that and then you, you can kind of layer this information together and totally worth it because I love using that information when we're out especially off trail like do it for route finding so one thing I did learn when I was researching this is that you can actually get discounted pricing if you purchase your membership through their website link here instead of doing it through the, the Google Play or the, the Apple Store and um, so go there if you want to get a little bit of a discount because I think a membership um, per year if you're just a regular member is like 20 bucks and like 40 bucks for premium so you get a little bit of a discount which is nice and and the nice thing about Gaia as well is they have really good online documentation about the functionality and then they also give you um, a great preview of their map gallery so you can go out and look at those now I've listed to some here but I also show like they have some really awesome stuff out there I use these all the time depending on where I'm going the US Forest Service 2016 one is probably the one I use the most unless I'm on BLM land and then I'll just use the USGS topo but you can get some really nice satellite imagery with some labeling if you like to visit national parks they have all of those maps out there if you're into flying I know they have some aviation stuff um, Nat Geo Trails Illustrated. So these are premium maps. So the, the ones I showed you before were through the membership. These are premium maps. So these are the even nicer ones. Um, Nat Geo Trails Illustrated. Nat Geo Trails Illustrated for, they have a bunch of them for the long trails. So if you're a triple crowner, I think almost all of them. I don't know if the Continental Divide Trail is on there, but I know for sure the PCT and the AT are on there. Um, and then they have some like, 
uh, if you're an international traveler, they have topographic maps for a lot of like Europe and Canada and Swiss Topo. This is like if, if you nerd out on maps at all, Swiss Topo is like creme de la creme of Topo maps. So it's really nice. Um, and then they also have, I call these overlay layers. So like the middle one here, that slope angle shading, if you lay that on top of like a USGS topo map, it really makes those contours pop and it's very easy for route finding. So if you're looking at this, you know, as the color gets darker, blacker, that means it's getting steeper. So it really points out um, where the, the steepest parts of the terrain are. And they also have great layers for like private land and public lands, snow depth, where we've had passing current wildfires, things like stream flows. And so if you click on like a stream flow gauge, it will tell you what the current flow is. So really great information. So this is just some screenshots of the actual app. And this is um, on an Android. So if you're an iOS iPhone person, this may look a little bit different, but they pretty much have all the same functionality now. So, you know, really nice. So this is what I was talking about with the, um, on that left-hand side picture, I've got that topographic map with the slope shading on, really nice, makes those contours pop. And it's also very organized. It'll show you, um, you know, you can look through your different folders. You can put things in folders if you'd like to keep things neat and tidy. And you'll have, you, you can look through your tracks, your hikes, different waypoints, what maps you have saved, what maps you've downloaded for offline use. And then here you can see in this um, third picture over that those that map layering I was talking about where you can stack these layers on top of each other and that toggle you're seeing that slider is the transparency so you can kind of modify the transparency of the layers sitting on top of each other to um, get the exact look and feel that you're wanting. And so this last one is showing you that create route I was telling you about where you can pick the mode and see here, I'm, I put a line along a, a, an old road and it popped right, right snapped right to that um, as I was drawing and I only put a couple of waypoints. So really, really cool functionality. Um, the other thing that, uh, so you can see here when you click on something, you can get information about it. So this is a loop that we did in Leslie Gulch area. And you can, um, once you've saved that, you can go back and look at your stats. You can see it on the map. You can get this really nice information about your speed and your elevation. So lots of information to get there. And that's also true of your waypoints. You can get, you know, you can show it on the map or see what the name is or when you actually did it. So this is that online companion map that I was talking about. Um, so you can see here, you can add in the different layers. You can add waypoints and tracks to it that can then be synced up to your phone. Here I'm showing that um, if you click on something in the map, you get the information I always love when they give you an elevation profile. And again, just really organized. You can set up folders to um, organize your information however you like. You can turn on and off the syncing of it up to your device. So if you want to like save space on your phone, you don't have to absolutely sync everything up. You can also turn things on and off publicly. And that means that people can discover your tracks. So, um, or also that means that you can share it with people. You can send a link out to people to your information. So here's just an example of if I went in and looked at a folder for, this was our Crew Leader College a couple of years ago. And really great, I took some pictures on that. Um, you, you can see it right on the map in there. You can write any information you want. Like we had some, I put some pictures in a Google photo and I put the link right in here so that I could always get to it. Another cool thing they do, I think they're trying to compete with, I believe it's like kind of like all trails where if you want to come in here and discover um, trails around you, they have those in here and you can save those out as your trails and then either download them to your phone or um, just look at them at the online companion map. That, that is also available through the, the app itself, it's just called Discover. So if you look at the, the bottom of the pictures, you'll see that Discover icon. You click on that and put in a keyword and it'll show you hikes around that, that area. And in this first picture, you can see it. Um, if you click the, the little green button in the, in the top right-hand corner of the image, you'll actually download that track. And you may even down, be downloading part of a, an offline base map around that track. Um, in the middle picture, you can see it's really easy to just save it, and then it ends up in your saved hikes list. So you can come back to it. 
All right. So another one that um, some folks really like to use is called View Ranger. I played around with this a little bit, but I still don't think it quite competes with Gaia. It is somewhere between free and $20 a year, still available through the um, Android Google Play or the iOS Google Apps or the App Apple Store. I'm not sure exactly what that's called, iTunes, Apple Store. Anyways, um, you can demo that, which is really nice. And the one thing that they do that I don't really like is there's these additional one-time purchases of maps. So it's like you pay the price for the app, but then you may have to be paying more to get some of the maps that you want. But it has all the same kind of functionality in that you can import and export GPX, which are GPS files, unlimited tracks with photos. It does have an online companion map that is not nearly as slick as the one that Gaia offers. Um, syncs to your phone, just like with Gaia. There are some limited free online maps for offline use. And if you are a um, wearable person, it is compatible. And I think that Gaia is also, but I'm not a wearable person, so I don't know for sure, but I think that's become very common. And you, and you can do some searching for trips. And again, here's just the idea of the pricing schema for View Ranger. So um, something else that they have, they have these kind of like, uh, View Ranger has these bells and whistles. So one of them is called Skyline. And this basically means, and there are other apps that do this as well, but you can hold your phone up to the Skyline and it's basically gonna create a little label for the different peaks or points of interest on the skyline. So if you're looking at it and you're like, oh, I'm not sure what that mountain is, you can hold it up and be like, oh, that's, you know, that's Boise Peak or whatever. Um, they do this, they have this flyover in 3D. So if you're a, a Google Earth fan, you'd probably like this. They also have this thing called Buddy Beacon. It's like, kind of like, require a signal. And I know there are a lot of places now um, that you can go and still get a signal, especially on the top of mountains. And so it could be useful in that way if you want to put your location um, out there so that, you know, really what it does is it puts your pin on a map that other people can go look at to see where you are. But again, you have to have service. So it's like by no means an emergency safety beacon. Okay, so another one is um, Backcountry Navigator Topo. And this unfortunately is an Android only tool, um, but it's, it's, I consider it to be a little bit more basic than Gaia GPS. It's still really user friendly. It's really easy to get the downloaded maps and it, but again, it does this kind of like initial, additional purchase of things, um, which I kind of like the, you pay one price and you get all, all these things versus having to pick and choose. But maybe if you're an a la carte person, you'd rather pick and choose. This might work better for you. Downloading offline maps, you can import and export GPX or CAML files. So instead of having something like an online companion map, you really have to go out and find the tracks or create tracks or waypoints in something else and then upload them to this app. Um, if you don't do a lot of that and you really just want to use it for navigational purposes while you're out hiking around, this could be just fine with you. You can still do um, photo and audio waypoints. You can search for trips, Android Wear supported. And they do have some syncing capabilities in that they will allow you to back things up through a Dropbox or a Google Drive account. So th this company is actually working on, um, and this was a Kickstarter project, uh, a new version of this app called Backcountry Navigator XE. And this is available for Android and iOS. I think that um, it's getting better and better as time goes on. Initially, I was not super impressed, um, but it's getting better and better. And even some of the reviews I was reading on it was saying that some thought it was better than Gaia, which kind of blew me away because that's kind of been the gold standard for, for um, hiking topo map um, GPS apps. But um, they're saying that it has a much easier um, user interface than the previous version. You can still download maps for offline use, but they have some lightweight base maps that don't take as much space. They're called vector-based maps. Uh, you can add points, lines, polygons. There is an online platform for doing trip planning, just like with Gaia. And, but they do have these other add-ons like parcels and game management units. If you are a hunter, that's, that's something that they're still working on, I believe. 
So again, just a pricing breakdown for, for the new Navigator XE app, three different levels. So very reasonable. They're all about this price, you know, somewhere between like 15, 30 some dollars a year. Here's some more information just so you understand the differences. They don't have, um, Navigator XE doesn't seem to have um, the same like breadth of base map options as Gaia does, but still a lot of really solid choices. They have the US Forest Service topo and some of the older style USGS topos. If you're a fan of Cal topo, they come from there. They're really um, nice looking base maps. And this is kind of what the app looks like. Um, a pretty nice user interface. You can come up here and in the first picture you can see it's easy enough to like go out and search for some sort of point of interest. In this case I was looking for a 20 mile lakes and it will just drop a pin and take you right to that on your map. Um, they have a really nice uh, menu. If you click the plus button it's very easy to either download your maps, start recording a track, if you want to do some sort of like annotating or drawing, you can, adding new waypoints. Um, so if you, if you um, have some sort of a trip that you've planned out, you can download that from the cloud, which to me means you're downloading it from their online interface, user interface. I thought that was a little bit interesting wording, but um, that will download it to your, your device. And then they do have this kind of cool little um, compass, compass thing that you can turn on. Um, so if you're navigating to a waypoint on your map or something, that could be useful. I'm not sure how well it works, but I, I would still definitely carry a real compass, <laughs> but kind of fun. Yeah, so this is their online map. So, you know, it's looking very much kind of like something with with Gaia where you can add points, lines, polygons, and they do also have the auto routing. So it will also follow um, trails and roads. So I can see how this is becoming a bit of a contender against them. But just really nice, um, clean user interface. Seems pretty easy to navigate around and do the simple things that you want to do. Another app I played around a little bit with, this one's just kind of fun. Uh, I don't know if I would use it for, this is not for um, necessarily navigational purposes, but really it's a way of tracking your adventures. And what it allows you to do is create these really cool little 3D videos. This could probably be something that, that we at ITA could be, we, we could maybe start incorporating a little bit because it's really fun to look at. Um, but basically what you can do is as you're, when you turn the app on and you start recording, you know, along the way, you could potentially be taking some pictures or making some notes. And again, I'm not gonna show you um, the little video that I have, but, but here's just a, so like, this makes it look, <laughs> I kind of joked that it made it look like this epic little trip, but really it was only about three miles up to this little knob that we hiked to. But as you can see, it recorded my whole track along kind of like a, a Google Earth type background. And each of those pins you see is a picture I took. And so when the video was playing, it'll stop at each of those pins and show you the picture and then proceed forward get to another pin, show you a picture, and it just kind of like moves around this 3D surface. And so it's really fun. Um, you know, I've been swapping little adventures back and forth with my family using this app. And you don't even have to necessarily do it when you're hiking. If you're just walking around someplace really cool, exploring some new city, this could also be a really cool tool for sharing, for sharing what you discovered. Another one that, that I, I really like is called Avenza Maps. And this is just like a super low bar for, for getting into using like the GPS on your phone. Because really what it allows you to do is you download a geo-referenced uh, PDF of a map. So it could be a USGS topo map. I know like here in the Boise area, Ridge to Rivers has their map on there. And it really just allows it to become a spatially aware. So when you pull the map up in this app, it'll show you where you are on the map. It also allows you to do um, photo waypoints, do some measuring. You can navigate to destinations that are on your map. If you want to import your own KMLs or GPX files, you can. Um, 
but it's just really easy and accessible. Again, here's some more information about pricing. I won't dwell on this too much, but similar pricing, about $30 a year. I would say for people who get out, the, the free version probably isn't, isn't as useful because you can only um, download up to three maps at a time. And you may, depending on what area you're in, you may need multiple maps to even cover that area. And so for the $30 a year, you can download and have unlimited maps on your device. So this is just kind of a preview. So it works in that, and you can do this on your phone as well, but you can go out to the Events of Maps website to their map store, and you can kind of peruse the maps that are available to you. Some of them are free, some of them you pay for. So in this example, I'm showing like the Rich River maps will cost you $5, but it's a one-time purchase and then you have it forever or until you want to buy the latest version. And so, and then you can see on the map here, it's pointing out what area that map encompasses. So it's really useful for figuring out if you know, for example, maybe you're doing a really long hike and that'll show you, okay, you need to actually download three or four maps maybe instead of just one. And um, so here you can actually purchase the maps for your not, and that will kind of sit in your cart. And then you can go out to your app and um, download them. So in the first screenshot here, you'll see, um, you know, I'm showing a picture of my device actually downloading the Ridge to Rivers map out of, out of the, the, my cart. And so the second screenshot actually shows the map and the blue dot with the crosshairs is my location. And it'll show you where you are on the map. And then of course you can place pins. So for example, on the third screenshot, I put a pin where there's a trailhead. And the fourth screenshot shows you just some of the capabilities that you have with using it. So really, again, nice user interface, clean user interface. And it's all tied to just a, a PDF map, basically. So there are many, many other online uh, or GPS apps available. Here's a few more that I've listed out. The first one I ever, ever used was called US Topo Maps. Um, really, really easy, basically just a topo map on your phone that shows you where you are. If you're into um, hunting, I know that Onyx Maps is really popular. They have some maps um, and more information having to do with like hunting units and things. Some of these other apps also have those, but I get the impression that Onyx Maps handles it better. Polaris UPS navigation, if, if you're into, um, I get the impression that Map My Hike is geared more towards folks who are like training for big hikes, um, it'll give you some more metrics and stats about your hikes that you can keep track of. GPS Essentials gives you all these bells and whistles having to do with stats. Um, it was a little overwhelming for me, but there are probably people out there who geek out on it. Another app is called Rambler. This is really kind of like a cool app for this kind of map-based journaling. So if you're into like making a cool story, that could be a fun one. And if you're into the whole 3D thing, obviously, there's probably other 3D apps out there at this point as well. But um, yeah. Uh, there's some more options that, that you can explore. And then a couple more of those, those apps to kind of show you the different peaks on the horizon, Peak Visor and Peak Finder. I've been using Peak Finder. And I find it's pretty good. Sometimes it's a, it's a little bit off and I have to guess a little bit, but it is kind of cool to point, point your phone at a picture uh, or at a, a skyline of a mountain range and have it just drop all these pins at the top of the peaks and tell you what they are. So just give you some more awareness. So, so just a disclaimer, like I'm, I'm no, in no way condoning that this should be the only thing you carry from now on. I, you, you just can't rely too heavily on a GPS app or even a recreational GPS for that matter. At least one person in your group should be carrying a paper map. Everyone should be kind of aware of their surroundings. You should be prepared for you know, potentially losing your phone, the battery dying, it getting damaged, falling into a creek, whatever, and still feel confident that you're going to get to and get out of where you're going. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay, I will keep powering on. We can do questions at the end too. 
So now I'm just going to talk about, um, I just did some research on some of the available options for like outdoor related apps that could be kind of either fun or, or potentially life-saving to have with you. Um, I don't know about you, but I think that if, if I was out there and an emergency happened, I, I've actually taken the, um, the, the Knowles Wilderness First Aid class and it was really, really helpful. But I have a feeling that like in the heat of the moment, I may not remember everything I could or should be doing. So luckily the, the Red Cross puts out this really awesome first aid app that you can have on your phone that you can keep offline. Um, so that's really awesome that you can just kind of like have that in your back pocket. So even if it's something minor like um, a cut or a bee sting, you can look up some information about how best to handle that. This isn't necessarily geared towards, you know, wilderness first aid, it's basic first aid, but I still think it's really useful, you know, if, if nothing else to kind of help you be like, okay, yeah, I'm doing the right thing here. Um, so something that you can just always have, and that's good for the back country or the front country. You never know when you're going to have a first aid emergency. Um, one that I've kind of perused is this SAS survival guide. So if you're a, a survivalist or a survivalist wannabe, who knows with everything going on right now, what skills we're going to need to have. Um, yeah, just kind of check this out. It's actually really kind of fun to just peruse through it <clears throat> and, um, you know, learn things about uh, there is some minor first aid, knots, medicinal edible plants, how you deal with extreme climates, Morse code signaling. So if you dig in an emergency, you can use your, your compass mirror to flag down the helicopter that's looking for you. Um, so also maybe just something fun to read while you're laying in your tent at night. So one I also really like is this wild edibles. I'm, I'm okay at identifying plants, but I have no idea which one I'd be able to eat. So I threw this in with survival and safety because you never know what you'll need to learn that it's okay for you to eat if you actually get stuck in a pickle somewhere. And then, um, yeah, so let's see, I have a couple of questions here. Let's answer some of those really quick before I keep going. So I have a Garmin InReach Mini with EarthMate, EarthMate app. I mostly use it for tracking and emergency communication. Does it have more capabilities like Gaia or should I have both? You know, that's a really good question. Um, we might come back to this because I might actually, I think Clay is on this call. I might actually have him ask that question. Um, I also, uh, we have a Delorum InReach, which is kind of the older, larger version of that with the EarthMate app, and I don't find it terribly useful, um, but I haven't actually played too much around with it for, for using something like navigation. It might work. We'll, we'll come back around to this, um, but I, I have both. Um, so SAA off works, does SAS work offline? Yes, it does. Yeah, all of these are offline capable, all the ones I'm gonna talk about. So Rory, we're gonna, we'll address your, um, we'll address your, your question. We'll make sure maybe Kelly can send you a message about that. Um, so Clay says he has not heard of EarthMate. So EarthMate is kind of the companion app for Garmin for the mini and for, so, so Clay, I think it's when, like if you are gonna send a text through your phone, through your mini, I think you use the EarthMate app to do that. Okay, we're gonna keep cooking along here. Dark Sky, this is a really cool, this is a really cool app um, having to do with weather. It's supposed to be really good at forecasting hyper-local weather because it uses, if you have, I don't know if this would be good for everybody's phones, but especially some of the newer, um, more expensive phones, pressure sensors to give you this more local forecasting and precip notifications. If you're a weather geek, you'll just love it. Um, I'm a, just a big fan of Weather Underground because I think they have really awesome maps. Um, I'm one of those people who will like hear a storm coming and bring up my Weather Underground and like watch it come in on the radar. <laughs> So I, I really enjoy it, and I like that it gives you, like, hour by hour. Um, okay, can everyone see my screen having to do with field guides? I track wildlife. Yes, okay. 
I'm actually going to go back one here. All right, so back to field guides. Two of the, the, the most awesome apps out there are iNaturalist and Seek by iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is really awesome because it's not only a field guide, but it, but it makes you become a citizen scientist. So this is kind of like a crowdsourced identification app. So you can come in and see other people's observations. You can submit your observations and the community will actually verify it for you. And, and when you think about it, you know, if you have all these people who are out making observations, you're really feeding science having to do with the plants and the animals. You know, I used to work for the Department of Fish and Game and, and we would literally, you know, pull information from this system to, to feed into our own databases so that our biologists are, are making better decisions based off of the available data, which is coming from all these awesome people who are using iNaturalist. Um, Seek is kind of a new thing and I haven't played around with it a whole lot, but basically the, the idea is that you can hold your phone up to something like in the middle image, you can hold your phone up to something and it's gonna try and tell you what it is just based off of image recognition. So I think this is really awesome because I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm trying to ID something, I'm like, well, it kind of looks like this flower, but it could be this flower. And you're going through the book and you're like, oh wait, no, that, that's only in Washington. We don't even have those in Idaho. So this kind of um, gives you information on the fly, which is really cool. So. Yeah, go, go take it out and um, see what you can find. Even in your backyard, I think it could be really cool. Okay, so if you um, find wildlife tracks, this one is also really cool, this iTracks wildlife. It's a little bit on the pricey side. Google Translate, it's like Google, oh yeah. <laughs> it's like Google Translate with flowers, exactly. Isn't that awesome? Um, so if you want to be able to ID those interesting tracks that you're seeing when you're going along, this could be a really fun one to take with you. And it, like, again, I said, all of these work offline. There are a lot of birder apps out there. Um, I'm not a huge birder, so I look for something pretty easy and I like the ones that give you the sound as well. Audubon is pretty easy for me to use. It has lots of really great photos and the sounds. Um, it does tie to eBird. I don't know, maybe eBird also has its own app, but the fact that it does tie to eBird. So eBird is kind of like the iNaturalist for just birds. So if you're a bird nerd, you know what eBird is, um, but it does the same thing where you can see other people's observations, but you can also submit your own observations of the birds. Um, and if you um, like to keep track of the different species you see, it does allow you to keep lists and share your sightings. Okay, if we have any stargazer out there, again, there are probably multiple apps for this. The latest and greatest that I know of is called Starwalk 2, and this allows you to explore the stars anytime, any place. You can find planets or constellations or any other um, objects that are in the night sky. And I think it's just like, you can hold it up to the sky and it will kind of show you what, what you're looking at through the, the lens of your, of your phone. One app that I really, really love and would highly recommend for everybody is this Idaho Wildflowers app. Um, this is a project that was put out through the University of Idaho. And what's really cool is if you look at the second screenshot there, the way this works is, you know, you can, you just pick things off the list. So for example, you like growth habitat. Okay, it's, it's, it's a flower. I know it's a flower and the main color is pink, so you pick pink. It is April 21st, so you pick April. I live in Southwest Boise, so I pick an image of Southwest Boise. What habitat am I? I'm in, you know, mountains, I'm in the high desert and I pick that and then boom, it automatically narrows down a list based off of the options that you just picked off of that screen. So again, you're not like fumbling through pictures, you're not, you're not IDing anything, you're not having to use much of a key beyond what you can easily um, pull off of that screen. So really, really handy for narrowing down your options. I've learned a ton of flowers this way because it was like super easy um, to narrow down that list and just give you some like suitable options. So definitely support um, that app, $7.99, totally worth it. 
So just some other noteworthy apps, um, geocaching. A lot of people probably already know about geocaching, but if you don't, it's really, really cool. I don't know if you know this, but there are geocaches pretty much everywhere. They're all over Boise. They're all over in the foothills. Um, I don't know a lot about geocaching. I've done a little bit of it, but the basic premise is, and there's all sorts of different kinds of geocaches. It could be an actual like little treasure chest. So you'll get like a geocache location and then you navigate with your phone, your GPS, your recreational GPS, whatever it is you're using that spot. And you're either going to find a little treasure chest where I think the etiquette is take something, leave something, or there might just be a little register where you put your name or it might be the thing where you just like check in that you were there or I think they have these like token things. Um, people have gotten very, very creative with the geocaching locations. I know um, we went and looked at a map of all the locations that's somewhere, I think, kind of like west of Mountain Home. There's a whole series of them in the shape of a choo-choo train. I don't know exactly how you, you tag all of those, but it's really cool to look at on the map. And I've met some people who, like, they travel the world geocaching. So remember the next time you're in vacation, your kids get bored pull up your geocaching app and send them on an adventure. Another really cool one is this Chimani National Parks app, um, all offline national park guide. It has like audio tour. Um, you can get like discounts for like lodging and things, really cool maps, um, lots of points of interest with cool historic information. Really, really cool if you're into doing national park travel. Another cool thing, if you don't know, Google Maps can actually go offline. This is super, super handy if you're traveling internationally and you don't have a signal. Because what you can do is before you leave home and you have a Wi-Fi signal or you're in your hotel, go to the Google Maps. Um, you can download a whole chunk of, an, of the map. And then when you get in your rental car and you want to be traveling, you can already have it preloaded on there with all the points of interest and everything like you would see on a regular Google map. So really, really handy. Um, some other things, so this doesn't necessarily have to do with, um, you know, maps or navigation or anything like that, but a lot of times when I'm um, going on a hike, especially a long hike, I might want to have some information downloaded with me, either like maybe a, a guide or some more information about a section or something. There's many, many ways to save that information on your phone. Obviously, Adobe Acrobat PDFs can be saved. There's this really cool app called Pocket. It will save decluttered web maps for offline reading. iOS Reading Cloud Android Chrome download, so you can actually treat a saved web page kind of like a permanent snapshot. And then if you use something like Google Drive, it's really easy to toggle on and off offline use. So if you need to save like Word documents or spreadsheets or anything like that, you can still be using them offline without a signal. So people always, um, you know, some people really scoff at using like a GPS app on your phone, like, oh, well, what happens if the battery dies? Like I go through my cell phone battery so quickly. But, but a lot of times, I mean, at least this is my scenario. So when I'm out there, I make sure one, I've restarted my phone and like all of the apps are off that I'm not using. And um, make sure that I'm, I'm not always keeping a track going the entire time when you're, when you're constantly paying satellites with your GPS, that will drain your battery. So, so the things I recommend is really get to know your phone, like test your battery life pre-trip. In your everyday life, how many times are you checking your phone? Potentially a lot, so that could be really draining, but when you're out there hiking, you may not actually be, be using it that much, and especially when you're in offline mode, it really isn't gonna suck down the power that much. So creating waypoints and tracks and download your offline maps pre-trip um, so that you're not having to do that while you're out there and kind of sucking up power pulling, basically using just data that will take, take more of your, your battery life. Use your airplane mode and then minimize screen brightness. So if you went in and analyzed um, what's using power on your phone, there's a good chance that the number one thing is going to be screen brightness. And I know it's can be really challenging, especially in like bright sunlight to see your screen. Um, but even, you know, 
try and keep it as low as you can or like just turn it up when you're looking at it and turn it back down. Shut down any unnecessary apps. Change your GPS settings to meet your needs. Many of those apps, um, the GPS apps will allow you to kind of customize your GPS settings. So, so even if you do want to lay a track, you could set like, I only want to lay down a, a breadcrumb, like a point on my track, like every five minutes or every hour instead of like every five seconds. That will make less and a lot less energy on your phone. Um, tracking will drain your battery, like I said. So I suggest using, I call it a breadcrumb approach where it's like, um, you know, if, if I'm unsure of where I'm going and I want to make sure I know how I'm going to get back, um, and it's a long trip, I will lay breadcrumbs. So, you know, like every, however long I'm comfortable. So for example, like every hour I might put a dot on the map. If you're in uncomfortable terrain, maybe you're off trail, maybe you do it every 15 minutes. That'll still get you back to where you started. You just go from point to point to point. Shut down your phone if you're not using it for extended periods of time. If you're not going to be using it, just stow it away. Carry a portable charger and extra phone battery. It used to be common for cell phones to have removable batteries, and that is not common anymore, which I find unfortunate because I thought that the phone batteries were way less, um, weighed less than the portable chargers, but now I carry a portable charger. And my portable charger will charge my phone, oh, two, maybe two times. Um, before it runs out two or three times and it's about the size of my palm and probably weighs 10 ounces or something. So, I mean, it's not a huge deal. It's a little bit of weight, but that'll totally get you through like a week or two, depending on how much you're using your phone battery. I mean, I've gone like 15 days with my phone and that small charger and they have chargers of different sizes. You can buy them online or at your local target or whatever um, for pretty cheap. And they're also really handy for like, even if I'm like a worker traveling, um, it's really handy to have that instead of, you know, having to look for a charger at the airport or something, you can just plug it into your little mobile charger. Protect your phone, your phone from the sun or the cold. So um, if it's really hot, I, will, I, I never put my phone in like the top, the brain of my, my backpack because that gets like the, the sun hitting right on it so I can get really hot. And then if it's going to be really cold at night, I'll actually kind of sleep with it. I'll put it in a sock or something and put it in my sleeping bag because the cold especially will really drain your, your battery life. And then just invest in things like a protective case and a screen glare reducer. I mean, this will this will really pay off for that time you drop it and um, you break the screen glare reducer instead of your actual screen or it bumps against a rocket doesn't break or gets the screen all messed up because you didn't have a protective case. Really cheap, find them anywhere. So again, like tech is a tool, it is not your savior. People will go into the back country and think the cell phone will be their savior. Sometimes it doesn't turn out that way. <laughs> so um, we, did a, we did have some folks from the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue come and do some talks on this. And they had some very interesting stories about people relying on their cell phones Please, like I said, please do not rely on your cell phone. It is not going to save you, especially in our, our backcountry areas. Don't ever expect to have a signal. Always carry something either like, like a spot or DeLorean Garmin in reach that is an actual emergency beacon or be in a group that's large enough that you feel comfortable that if something happened to someone, other people could find their way out to get help. Carry maps carry things to get you through extended days out there in case something happens, just be prepared. Okay, so that's kind of the end of my talk. Um, I'll open it up for questions again, if anybody has any questions or comments of any kind, I'm happy to share. So let's see. Um, Okay, so I do see one question here from a little bit ago. Ariel says, if I already have a Garmin inReach and a GPS watch, what app would be useful to me that these divorce devices don't already do? Any benefits to the apps instead of my inReach? Um, I honestly think this is all about preference. Um, 
I don't know how long your GPS watch lasts. Um, this has been the barrier for me getting into the wearables because I get the impression that um, those won't last for like multiple, multiple days. So, um, you know, I, I guess I always, I've just gotten in the habit of having both my inReach and the GPS app because I don't have the watch. But like I said, I, I would totally play around with some of them to see if you would find any benefit. I mean, the other nice thing about having the app on your phone is it's a larger screen. And so you can see a little bit more what's going on ahead of you than maybe on something like a GPS watch. Yeah, Alan says, I'd love to share with a friend and it will be posted so I can send a link. Yes, so so anybody who's on this call, um, I'm going to send up a follow-up email that will have this slide deck that you just seen. And this is also being recorded and it will be put up on our YouTube. And so I'll also put a link to our YouTube channel so that you can see that recording and share with whoever you like. Okay, well with that, I'm just, I'm gonna wrap up by saying, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, so the Idaho Trails Association is actually gonna be setting up something we call the ITA Trails Reporter, where you can go out and let us know about the trails that you're hiking on. Um, and this is just a, some screenshots of what it would look like. It's just a basic survey where you can give us some information about what you're seeing, what trails you're on, what trail you were on, when you were out there, did you um, see any fallen trees, was there any washouts, any snow, if you want to give us any other details, give us some photos, GPS points, if you see a big down tree, it'd be really awesome to have a picture and a waypoint for where that is. And then, so after that is posted, the, that information will actually come to a um, map where you can search through other people's reports or look around on the map to see um, what information people are posting. It is mobile friendly. This is not offline. You have to have an internet access to get to it, but it is a, there is a mobile friendly version where you can also go and look for trip reports. And it's, what's really nice about this map is that if you click on one of the, the trails reports in the left-hand side, it will automatically zoom to where that is on the map. And on the map, I actually have the Idaho Parks and Rec trails layer on there. So you can see um, all of the trails are on that map as well, because it's really, really handy for us to get things like the trail number and trail name. Um, and if you, I think if you click on the trails, you can also get some information about those as well. Anything that is red with those little dot, dot symbols is a non-motorized trail. Yeah, and you can see other people's pictures if they've posted them up there. And um, the map does allow you to, so where these arrows are, you can kind of slide these areas back and forth. So if you want to, you know, make the map a little bit larger or shrink aside, the, the trail information, you can do that. You can kind of make it your own little space when you're searching around. And it's got some handy tools that allow you to, you know, you can search for places. You'll have a legend that shows you what all of the different symbologies of those different trails and roads are on there. You can change the base map. So if you're looking for something in real particular, you can maybe turn on the imagery. Um, and then also you can turn different layers on and off. So that's it, you got the sneak peek. That is gonna be coming to our website. So yeah, please keep us in mind when you're out hiking trails. Um, if you if you wanna give us a report, that would be super, super awesome. And keep us in mind for, for Idaho Gives starting tomorrow through May 7th. Um, we will be accepting donations and trying to raise money for our, our, our budding youth program. And so with that, for Idaho Gives, we're actually gonna do presentation like this every week. So next week, we're going to have my friend Carrie come and talk about backcountry cooking. And then on May 6th, really, really looking forward to the ITA Digital Campfire Tales, where we're going to have um, some folks who have been on our trips from our youth trips, our women-only projects, some of our regular trips, come and tell, tell some stories about their experiences, 
pages, maybe smatter in a little bit, little bit of music by our, our trails director, Clay. And please come and join us to hear about their experiences and what it's like to come out on our project. And if you yourself have a story, we'll open it up for you to tell stories as well. So it'd be really, really awesome if you can join us. I don't know if you have like a, a fire pit in your backyard. Maybe you can cozy up to that while this is going on. We can make it feel like we're all sitting around the campfire together. So that's all I have for you guys. Thanks so much for coming with us, um, coming, coming on with us today. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, you can um, go to our, our, our Facebook page or to our website and submit any follow-up questions. And again, I'm going to send out an email to you all. You can also just reply back to that if you want more information. And, and if, if people want or more information about anything I've talked about, and I'm always open to just, you know, meeting up and talking about it, you know, once our, our social distancing period has, <laughs> has come and gone and we're allowed to be around each other again. And hopefully you all will sign up for trail projects when we are, we're ready to go. So with that, thank you so much.